This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John McEnroe. Joining me, as always, my cousin Adam, the Jock Strozinski. For the first time in 13 weeks, we get to talk about a victory. The Detroit Lions finally got off the schneid. They got a W in a weird way. The audience was not as expected, being that uh, the fans of the Detroit Lions did not attend the game in high volumes. But, hey, give credit to Dan Campbell. Give credit to Jared Goff. Actually looked like an NFL quarterback for the first time in 2021. And the Lions came back. Nobody thought they would march down the field and secure a touchdown drive after Dan Campbell bungled everything with his decision-making. I can't wait to hear your thoughts about his play calling because when I asked him directly about the play call, what he said actually made it sound a little bit worse, and we're going to break it all down. A snub, I can't believe a major Heisman snub has happened, and of course, we'll give Adam the floor to let him rant and rave and share his experience watching the Michigan Wolverines finally, after seven years of Jim Harbaugh at the helm, meeting... A goal, a standard, an accomplishment, something that the program can hang their hat on, especially knowing that a big matchup is ahead on New Year's Eve. So it's a big one. It's a nice one. This edition of Doc and Jock will have some positivity to talk about for once, as well as some strong critiques of the uh, programs here in town. But cuz, how you doing? How you living? What's happening? Look, man, it was a good weekend. If the Lions can come out with a win and Michigan wins the Big Ten championship and now they're in the college football playoff, I think all is right with the world. Except, except, we're going to talk about it. Dan Campbell has made my list. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. I think I want to first start the show with a dramatic and out resilient, if you will, yes. Lions victory. You were there taking it all in in person. I want to know what was going through your head. I mean, I was following along on Twitter. Uh, I was watching a lot of the beat writers. I was watching you tweet. I'm watching this unfold, and I'm screaming at my TV as they're they're marching down the field because everything was in the middle of the field. There was nothing to the sidelines. They had wasted timeouts earlier in the game, right around that four-minute mark, where we're going to talk about Dan Campbell shoving his head up his own ass. And this team hitting into the red zone, and then takes a delay of game. And then this team still figures out a way to fight and come away with a dramatic touchdown. I was, I was, I was impressed. I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought they were going to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, I was blown away that this team was able to gut out another win or gut out a win. And, and I was, I think more impressed that the team, again, just, they don't give up. They, they don't, collapse they there there's nothing but adversity this season and this team seems to find a way to 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 rise to the challenge and and put forth an effort that is that is valiant uh doesn't always come away with the w but this time they did and i think that is remarkable of a team to consistently be in these situations which leads to your head coach being a boob <laughs> but to consistently be in these situations and for the team to not break, for the team to only get stronger from it, I, I think is is pretty resounding and pretty outstanding. What was it like watching it high above uh, in Ford Field at the, the the palatial estate for all of the beat writers? Yeah, it was you know a situation where it's a little bit quieter because a large contingent were still in Indianapolis covering the Michigan Wolverines, and that's where the juice was. That's where the action was. The Lions kind of just felt like the you, you know when you go to. Uh, a concert and there's a huge headliner and then there's just some you know some person opening that's just kind of gaining traction and you're like okay we can go get drinks we can wait an extra half hour and uh, wait till the 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 main event starts that's what the Lions kind of felt like Uh, driving in was smooth there was nobody there maybe what four pockets of tailgates with maybe five people each it was dead. Dude, it, it was let me crazy. put it like this. I was offered tickets to that game. Free yeah, tickets. I was right. offered two free tickets. And they were pretty decent seats. And You're I was like, like nah. no, I'm good. Yeah, exactly. I'm no, good. there's no way that if you didn't have to be there in a working capacity to go see that with COVID, with the offense scoring less than 20 points on average, it's better to stay at home. And shit, it was cold. The experience is not worth it versus all the stuff that, you know, is out there in terms of COVID, parking, the costs. 
Dude, you can you can buy a six pack, handle your business, watch the lions cuss in, in private, and do your thing. It's it's just a better experience. And to be honest, cause when you look at it compared to Jerry's World and SoFi Stadium, Ford Field is kind of outdated. You know, they pumped money into it, but it's a fun experience. But how many times do you really want to see uh, a parent hold up their kid? That's the experience at Ford Field. It's like, <laughs> come on! It's not. It's not. They they made a nice stadium. It's That's already. Funny. It's already. It's already. It's already. It's already outdated. It's already outdated for the fan experience in regards to digital quality, entertainment, and big screens. It's like, come on. So you watch the game, and I found myself, obviously, when you're writing, you have to kind of have two stories going on, the win and the loss. So you're busy. You're, it's hectic. But it had everything that most Lions games have, you know, nice plays, bungled efforts here and there. You realize, okay, I was pleasantly surprised that the offense did some things. But I always find myself going, oh, my God, you know, Mike Zimmer – how are you going to lose to this team? That was my running thought was, wow, you guys are really taking it lightly and performing at a level that's beneath the Minnesota Vikings, especially when you're five and six, your season's hanging in the balance. That's the effort you give. Now with all of that, all the Vikings had to do was pressure the Lions, force the Lions offense to do some things. Instead, I just feel like I want to go into defense and just bring back press man coverage, make press man coverage great again. Because seriously, you gave the Lions that much cushion. And here's the thing I think that scares everybody. Just give up the big play. If you give up the big play, you might have the chance to get the ball back. This fear of getting beat, this prevent defense, time and time again gets you beat. And the Vikings went with it. And the last play was just the height of embarrassment in regards to the fact that it's one play. All you got to do is jam the receiver. You don't play back. Amonra St. Brown could have skipped into the end zone. So you realize that the Lions were, uh, the Lions and the Vikings were trading the wind back and forth, and it was embarrassing. And you're just like, you're sitting there going, where is the, you know, because I, I would tend to believe most people would think that you and I are high achievers. We, we care about our product. The reason why the podcast is somewhat successful is because of the fact we care about it. And so the attention to detail is not there in regards to the, these two teams. It was wild. It was crazy because the offense for the Lions started well. Then it stalled. Then they, they, they gave up the lead, which everybody expected. Then Campbell like handed it to the Minnesota Vikings who couldn't take advantage. They get the touchdown, but then they can't stop the Lions. So you recognize this game had everything. It was back and forth. It was nice to hear the crowd erupt. It was nice to see the celebration on the field. So it's a mad dash to get everything done. Uh, luckily, our system provides us an easy way to go back and forth. So boom, the, the play happens. At first, you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, please don't intercept it. No fumble. Uh, you know, Let something good happen. And it, and it was great. It was nice to see the crowd stick with it, especially after how mad they got. They were into it. And the Lions get the victory. It was nice to see. It was nice to see Goff at least perform well, find his tight end, zing the football around. You know, I'm not giving him as much credit as the rest of everybody is because, you know, you got nothing to lose when you're doing it when you're 0 and 10. Can you, I would have respected that more if you started to do that in week two and three, not when you got nothing to play for and the Vikings are just handing you yardage. So he made some throws. He looked like an NFL quarterback. He looked like he stepped it up a little bit, more comfort level. It's great, but I think what has everybody talking is a couple of things. The celebration afterwards, what that meant. And Dan Campbell, because yes, you won, but you didn't have to make it so, you made it harder on yourself because fourth down and less than a yard and you roll it out with Jared Goff, that play call was terrible. So I asked him, I said, why don't you just hand it off? Did the Vikings defense so, show you something that you, you you tried it on fourth down and you sneaked it, you couldn't get that? You tried again on your on your side of the field late in the game? I said, why not hand it off? And what he said was crazy because, in essence, he, what Dan Campbell explained to me was, he's like, well, to be honest, I really hated my third down call. So my mind went to, of course, you don't say nothing, but you said, okay, so your answer to why the fourth down call was really bad was I also had a bad call on third down too? So you didn't learn from the third down mistake and you went and, and butchered it again with another one? That was great. I almost started laughing. I had to really bite my tongue. And be like, uh, okay, really the answer should have just been, look. And he, he eventually got to it. He said that, you know, if they would have executed better, they would have had the guy open. But Jamal Williams was covered. Nobody was fooled. And it was really a bad call because 
you sh- you could have just lined up golf and tried again to sneak it. You don't roll out and try to surprise a team with the slowest quarterback in the league and in a, in a, in a passing attack that was good earlier in the game, but you can't say globally that that offense in terms of passing is reliable. So it's just funny because Dan Campbell's trying shit. He's gambling. He don't care. And I thought it cost the it potentially cost the Lions an opportunity to win. I didn't like the call. I and but I get it. You want to be aggressive. You saw that your quarterback tried to sneak it, didn't go anywhere. You wanted to pass the football. I just find it interesting that you don't trust your defense because I would have liked to have seen the defense maybe get a hold. Maybe that could also send the team. You know, I'm not sure exactly which is better, having the the offense prove something and getting it or letting the defense get a stand for once as well. But hey, the Lions bailed out their coach, but it it, do, it does raise more red flags like, dude, you got to run the game right. And I, I know it pissed you off. Yeah. I mean, I sent you what I think <laughs> it was like nine messages back to back to back with questions to ask and me just filleting right. Dan Campbell. Look, I was a huge fan of this guy. I loved this hire. I thought it was going to be great. I did have some apprehensions when he did take over because he doesn't have a a coaching – he doesn't have a head coaching background. He was a tight ends coach. He was a position coach. For Dan Campbell to take over play calling Sheesh. and basically heap more responsibility onto his already burdensome plate because he's learning on the job. Now you're going to try to learn another position on the job when you haven't even mastered being a head coach yet? And look, play calling is difficult. Play calling is is not easy. And look, he is very, very transparent. He tells you, he probably tells you too much for him to come out and say, yeah, I really screwed up on third down. And I, you know, if I could do fourth down over again, I would have done fourth down over again. Okay, fine. It's fourth and one and you're on your 30 and you have the lead. You do not. I repeat, you do not. Like there are situations in in game where you have to do things correctly. There is a there is a, a a set playbook that you have to follow from your own 30. Fourth and one, you do not go for it. Or if you do go for it because you're a gambling man like Dan Campbell appeared to be in this game because we still don't know what the hell Dan Campbell is. Is he a gambling man? Is he conservative? He's either – he's one or the other. He, he It's like he's bipolar. He ends up going on with, with, a, with, a, with play action and a rollout. And there's nobody, there's nobody basically staying in to help chip or help block if anybody gets through the offensive line. So you've got Jared Goff out there basically on a string by himself. It is fourth in less than a yard. <laughs> like if you if you were to take your foot and you were to look down at your foot and basically go from your shin all the way to your toes, that's how far they had to get to get a first down. And you go with play action and a rollout? Mind you, we have crucified this roster because the the receiving court and the quarterback have absolutely been atrocious all year long. The strength of this team is running the football <laughs> and handing it to your to your running back. Yet you choose to go away from that by your 30-yard line. Like it made no sense, like it made absolutely no sense. This this game was won in spite of Dan Campbell. Yes. Dan Campbell tried everything in his power to flush this game down the toilet yet again. Now, cause this I, is I now got- the fourth or fifth week in a row Dan Campbell has cost this team. And this week, he damn near cost this team. Like It was amazing that they were able to win this game, and Jared Goff did look like an actual quarterback for about two minutes there. But it, it, like unreal, absolutely unreal. You know what's kind of now starting to creep in my mind? Dan Campbell... 2022, 2023 gets the allotment of talent that you want valiantly gets the quarterback or maybe keeps golf for another year or so gets to the playoffs, has a lead. And then it's time to make good decisions, run or pass what to do critical moments. And then he costs us a victory in the postseason. I think that would light the fire under everybody because you have to remember a coach just doesn't all of a sudden become a master decision maker. Okay, it just doesn't automatically get that way. So if this is what you're showing now, what does that mean when it's crunch time, when it's the playoffs, and you got to decide what to do on fourth and inches and you're on defense? Do you rush? Do you play off? Do you make the decision? I'm hoping 
that he's learning on the job and figures this all out and learns when it's crunch time because it is unbelievable. Like, you and I are, are, are watching. Everybody's watching. It's not easy to make these decisions on the fly, but that's what you're getting paid a six-year deal to figure out is when it's crunch time, you have you got to have this all played out twice, you know, three, four times already in advance. I feel like in the game of uh, chess, you know, Dan Campbell's still the pawn and he's still reacting to everything. And I want somebody using their using their pieces to, to kind of get to the queen and get after it and get to the get to the king and, and try to get a checkmate. But Dan Campbell is taking a stance that's, that's not going to that's uh, right now very concerning because I could see this mistake happening at the highest level of professional football, and that's just going to piss everybody off because the warning signs were there. This is this is my problem. Going into the year, the bar was set so low, right? <laughs> like the, the, we 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 didn't we didn't expect wins. Nobody expected wins. We asked for this team to look competitive, all right, and they've looked really competitive in a lot of games. I think they've looked more competitive in more games than we ever anticipated. All right, so check. All right, we asked for growth. We wanted to see growth from the players. We like we knew going into this season, the roster was not great. There was limited talent. There were a lot of draft picks on this team, and we wanted to see those guys grow. We wanted to see what was what was going to happen with some of the free agent signings. We wanted to see how this team would kind of gel and if they would look better at the end of the season than they did at the beginning of the season. And I think through this point, they have. They, they, they look much better now than they did earlier in the year. And I think there's been a lot of growth, especially with a lot of those young rookies that they've drafted. Okay, so check. All right. You wanted to also see growth and capabilities from your head coach. And I think this is probably the sticking point. And this is probably the issue that we all have. I don't think anybody has a problem with Dan Campbell being ultra aggressive. I don't think anybody has a, a problem with Dan Campbell being ultra conservative. But there are times where you have to take what is given in a game and you have to take that information and you've got to be able to to adjust to it accordingly. Hmm. And Dan Campbell through through what is this week 14 of the season, Dan Campbell hasn't shown the ability to manage a game properly. And that's a problem. You had the same issue with Jim Caldwell who was great Monday through Saturday. Sunday rolled around. The guy forgot what he was doing. My man had two watches on his wrist, and he couldn't tell time. That's what you got with Jim Caldwell. Yeah, he was the winningest coach in Lions history, but he was awful at managing a game. In-game management was horrible. You go to Matt Patricia, same thing. In-game management, horrible. Horrible. You go to Jim Schwartz, in-game management, horrible. You just go down the line. Managing a game... That's why you're just the head coach. That's why you delineate and you and you and you you give off responsibilities to other people. That's why you brought in Anthony Lynn to be your OC. So that way you can be aware of everything that is going on. You can you can handle whether or not a timeout needs to be called. You can realize and recognize that hey, the defense isn't in the right position and there's a chance for us to give up a big play. Call that timeout. Make sure that gets corrected so that way you don't have to use another timeout and get penalized and cost yourself a game. Right. You can also realize, hey, it's fourth and one. Run the uh, ball. Run the ball. Run Sneak the ball. The ball. Like, we've been doing a pretty good job running the ball all day. Uh, we are backed up on our 30. I want to be aggressive here. Let's go for it. But we're going to run the ball. We're not going to play action and go into a rollout. We're not going to try a bootleg and throw the damn ball. No. Like – you 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 can you can focus on on much much more and have much more of an even steady hand over this team instead of these epic ebbs and flows with being ultra aggressive or ultra conservative you know and then this is the other thing too so now Jared Goff gets sacked and and it's a strip fumble and he loses the ball and you have Minnesota taking over inside the 20 or within or inside the 30 and what happens next right you send your defense out there, and instead of just letting them score, you're trying to stop them. And like you end up burning a timeout, and you end up wasting time. Save your timeout so when you get the ball back, you can march down the field and you have one in, in case you need it. Instead, you, you probably wasted almost a minute, minute and a half. You wasted a timeout just to end up giving up the touchdown and getting the ball back. Like, I'm happy that the defense stopped them on the, on the two-point conversion. I applaud that all day long. But as a head coach, you need to be more aware of what's going on. Hey, 
we just screwed up royally here, right? We basically have given them the ball where we, we've got a, a clock basically ticking down. Do we waste our time out? No. Just let them score. We'll get the ball back with roughly three minutes, three and a half minutes left, and we'll have a timeout in reserve. Instead, you get the ball back with less than two minutes, and you got to go into your hurry-up offense, and you got to try to move the ball down the field. Now, thankfully, they were able to do it, but – this is a team that hasn't proven over the course of 14 weeks that they've got the ability to, to get the ball downfield into a big play wide receiver's hands and for that big play wide receiver to make an educated play, like get out of bounds. Everything on that two-minute drive, they're so lucky they didn't get cost. They, they didn't cost themselves. Everything on that two-minute drive was over the middle. It was over – like TJ Hawkinson I think had three receptions and everything was over the middle. You'd pick up seven to seven to ten yards and it was all over the middle. You'd have to run back up. You're basically wasting downs and you're wasting time. Save that time out. Give yourself an opportunity to do more. Again, it's just bad play calling and bad in-game management. And that's what pisses me off about Dan Campbell. I wanted this to work out. There are now too many red flags after, after 14 weeks where I'm just like I, I don't even know what the hell's going on here. Okay, I will say this. You also have to leave room for the capability that, that Dan Campbell learns from all this, that in this season it's just not as easy as we're making it out to be to make corrections, that it's such a whirlwind that things are so, you know, you, it, it, with the practice restrictions and the way the players are coddled, that making look, a correction look, is really you, hard. You, you look, Me and you have talked about this before. When you're at the stadium and you're watching the game, it moves much quicker than it does when oh. you're at home, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Okay. So now imagine being the head coach on the sideline. It's going to move at about 10 times as fast as it does when you're sitting in the press box. So the, the game just moves at a rapid pace. There's no reason for you to be the play caller then. Right. Because right. you obviously can't make educated play calls. Like, there's no reason you should be learning on the job and learning on the job for another job. And you know what I'm saying? And remember, like, too. Like, there's just no reason for it. And remember, too. He admitted early this year that on Monday evening, or I believe, or Tuesday morning, he sits with an analytical guy. He sits with a quality control manager, and they go over all the calls that were made, whether it was analytic, uh, was whether it was analytically correct, uh, what the eventual outcome could be, what an alternative decision could be. So he's had 12, 13 of those sessions. Where's the growth? Where's the consistency? That's the part that. I think is making everybody a little bit nervous is that you're making a one or two play calling mistakes every week for the last five weeks. And every week you're saying, I regret this. I regret this. I regret this. Okay. We need you to, but at the same time, you do got to give Campbell credit for the last drive and for golf in the offense, kind of looking like they understood a little bit that, Hey, nobody's enjoying uh, the dink and dunk in the check down Charlie situation. So he does get credit for that. Late game is where we're looking at it in terms of fine-tuning. And the reason why we're doing it, when people ask, why are you so critical of this? We're looking at it in that when the time comes and the lights are the brightest in the playoffs, this could happen again. And this is what delineates winners from losers. You look at, I'm loving the man in the arena on ESPN Plus with uh, Tom Brady. And you look at the small margins of what it takes to win. It's razor thin at the highest level of football. And a, a simple 10 men on the field will get you killed in the playoffs if you do that in the fourth quarter. Or a, a situation on fourth down on your own 40 and you go and you go for it and you call a, a, a rollout. You know, you, you got to run this at an advanced level. That's just basically to be at, on par with the elite. To become someone that wins, you got to outthink them. You got to outthink your compadre. So we're not comparing Dan Campbell to you know the worst teams. We're not comparing him to Houston and and Jacksonville and Urban Meyer. We're comparing Look, him man, to, to the best. I'm not even comparing him to Bill Belichick or the best. I, am. I just need you to 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 just just do be things normal. the be, appropriate be, way. Be normal. Just do things the right way. Be normal. Right. Be normal. And that's that's the part that we're all concerned about. That's why we're taking such a serious look at this for the last half hour is that it's serious because if you don't run the game right, if you don't learn it, just because you get more talent does not guarantee that this is going to turn around. So credit to the Lions for getting the win. The celebration was cool. I think everybody loved my joke about how Sheila got her groove back. <laughs> that was what, funny. Was it excessive? Me, I, I think you should celebrate. 
But I think the boundary that was crossed is, you know, smile at your owner. You don't bear hug. <laughs> you don't bear hug Sheila Ford Hemp in a way where, and, and okay. then Sheila as well should not come up to him and be like, I'm freaking believable. Look, she should have been like, I want more. Good. She should have been there waving her finger in his face being like, that's good. I'm proud of you. Now I want more. This is this is why this organization is a clown show. <laughs> it's because of stuff like that. Like I blame this purely on Sheila because Dan Campbell's in the locker room with the guys and she comes running in and she runs into his arms and like he picks her up like like they're doing dirty dancing and and nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> like like you guys can have a private moment in private. You can have that moment there. You don't need to have this this moment in the locker room with everybody. Like the, Sheila's a, Sheila is 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 an absolute atrocity as an owner herself. Like I was really hoping she would be different than her parents, but she has all of the same foibles and she has all of the same problems that they do. This organization from the top down is absolutely brutal. Like John, it is so damn bad. Would you ever see Jerry Jones run in and <laughs> and, and, and do that with with uh, Mike McCarthy? No. The answer is no. Like like, would, would you ever see Robert Kraft come in and do that with Bill Belichick? The answer is no. Now these guys have embraced after they won a Super Bowl, but not after they won one game out of thirteen attempts. Like. I, look, it's so comical that they're like, go look for it. There's a YouTube song yeah. for, for the Lions winning their first game. <laughs> they won. Like, exactly. it, It's amazing. The fans are just way over. Like it, it, it literally like you had people crying. You had people like <laughs> reacting in a way like, uh, look, I get it. I get your fandom. I get it's been be a year. Be better, guys. Just be better. <laughs> yeah, it's um a situation in which. We want to look at it like those that say, act like you've been there before. The reason is a win is a win. It's great. But we're more angry that you had, you know, there's a, there's two tallies. Okay. The Lions in the last couple of years have added three tallies. There's the win column. There's a loss column. And there's a tie column. Okay. So in the win column, it's one. Now you can cry and cheer about that one. Or you can say there are people that are looking at that big fat 10 and saying, what the hell? It's the National Football League. You could bop into five wins if you just are mediocre. That's the part people are not understanding. Great. You won a football game. Great. It's a rebuilding year. Great. I get it. But there, you do have to take into account people are mad that the football team continues to lose year after year after year after year. And don't want to reset and be like, this is year one of Dan Campbell. You say there's a big fat 10 in the loss column, and it shouldn't be that way. So I look at it like this. I'm happy the team is rebuilding. I'm happy the rookies and Panay Sewell are performing at a decent level. Now it's time to turn our attention to the rest of the season and the draft. And you better follow it up with the free agency class and, a, and, and two wide receivers that know how to catch the football and get open. But I'm liking the rookies that have performed. I think that the defensive linemen have played well. Panay Sewell is really performing well at a high level, top three linemen since week six. So if and then you come across the decisions to uh, rebuild this roster, then you got to make the decision on the quarterback. And that's the biggest decision that the Lions will face. But now, finally on this Lions thing, they can't get any more wins, right? They have to secure number one. You can't go fool around and start getting two and three wins here and get on a roll and cost yourself Aiden Hutchinson or Tavon Kivido, right? They can't. I, like, I want to agree with you. So I want to agree. I, like having having the first overall pick is important, but at at, at what expense, right? Like, do, do we have? Uh, we're going into week fourteen here. Do do we have? Four more weeks. It would be four more weeks, right? 14, 15, 16, 17. So do we have four more weeks of Dan Campbell looking like he should be wearing a helmet with a drool guard? <laughs> because if that's the case, I don't necessarily know that I want that. I do want that first first round pick, right? I want that first overall pick. But I don't want Dan Campbell to look like he's the kid who licks windows on the back of the bus, you know? Like I need him to look like he's a capable, comp competent coach. If, if Dan Campbell goes out there, looks like – 
you like between in the next four games, if we see some, we see some dramatic growth from Dan Campbell at, with his coaching acumen and his coaching IQ, and this team still loses games. I, the, when, 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 okay. winner, winner, chicken dinner. We'll, revi- we'll we're, revisit. We're, we're right where we want to be. Okay, we'll revisit it. But hey, we're in the we're in the win column, baby. Finally, a victory. <laughs> Nobody saw it, but hey, it's all good. Um, those- Dude, I, w- I will tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. So my stepdad was over to watch the Michigan game. This can be our, our, our segue into the Michigan game. Uh, my stepdad was over to watch the Michigan game. And before he left, he looked at me. He was like, take the Lions and the points tomorrow. They're going to win outright. I just kind of looked at him and laughed. I was like, get the hell out of here. I don't. I didn't remember him saying that until about 10 o'clock on Sunday night. And I was like, that mofo predicted it. He got it right. I got off the phone with him a little bit ago, and I was like, dude, how did you know? He was like, I don't know. He was like, but I was right. And I was like, you hit it spot on. Like, you you hit the nail on the head. And it, it was it was crazy that he did that, that he called it. He was the only guy I can think of who called it. Yeah, it's good because of the fact that, hey, you did it for Oxford. You did it for a community that was reeling. You played well. You sent the fans home happy. You needed it. It was, you know, almost, you can't go a year without winning a football game. It felt like a long year, but, you know, in regards to this rebuild, the Lions can move forward now, and, and, and we can turn our attention to the college teams because the college team's future seems really bright with Mel Tucker and Jim Harbaugh with what they accomplished this year. Bro, I'm going to tell you something. When – Michigan fan. Now I always, I've always looked at this from the Michigan State perfect, uh, perspective, and how happy I was that they were winning and they got to the college football playoff. I didn't care about anybody else. I was happy, but to see the reaction of everybody on the interwebs and the sports world and the TV and the media. When Michigan performs well, it's like everybody starts pimp walking, and it's like the world is right again. That the mighty Michigan Wolverines are back in the big time thralls of college football and to see articles that we're putting up there getting read to that degree to see uh content that Michigan fans want to read about my god you guys were thirsty and my god did they give you guys the water in the oasis that was the desert of Michigan football for the last five years and my god you guys were thirsty and I'll, I'll just say this enjoy the walk my god you guys are so thirsty you guys just were sitting there on the keyboard waiting to just say we're awesome we're the best we're back to where we belong we love Jim Harbaugh you guys have been waiting for a decade to basically sit there and start typing all the stuff that you wanted to type. And I'll let you have it. It's nice. Nice on you guys to beat lowly Iowa and to handle your business. Nice for you guys to call trick plays and uh, to dominate offensively. Nice for Aiden Hutchinson to ball out in Indy and for all the fans to have a good time with it. So I'll say this. It is nice that Michigan's back. It's a good story. It brings about positivity. Everybody's smiling in the sports world. You couldn't find a negative tweet about Jim Harbaugh on Saturday. And for everybody that said Jim Harbaugh this, Jim Harbaugh that, I'll say this. It's not Jim Harbaugh. Whenever you're in doubt, you got to go to Big Brother. And Big Brother came came to his rescue and was like, look, Jim, you had this old fuddy-duddy that couldn't do anything on defense. I got a guy from my staff. Go take him and make him a coordinator. So just like my tweet said that was very popular, John Harbaugh gets all the credit. Jim gets credit for acknowledging that he couldn't handle it on his own, and he delegated properly and figured out that, oh, boy, I better figure this this culture out real fast. And the best thing that he did, in my opinion, was change the culture, have a, a staff that's young and energetic, stop making the, the Michigan program a mortuary, and woe is us and, and things like that. He turned it around. Aiden Hutchinson made it a fun factory again. And while I joked at that from Sports Illustrated, it bears fruit, having fun, in sports and having talent makes it so that you're willing to ball out. So all is right in the world. I think that Michigan being in the college football playoff, I just love the fact that the the committee screwed you guys. That's crazy. I think that you win 42 to 3 and you stay where you are. That's ridiculous. You deserved. I think Michigan got screwed and potentially got screwed out of the national title because of the fact that you should be playing Cincinnati as number one seed. No way in hell do you end up uh, deserving to play Georgia after the run that you had. Defeating Ohio State, winning the Big Ten title, kept you in the same spot? My God, that's a lack of respect to Michigan. I'd love to argue with you, but I can't. Yeah, you can't. I can't. You can't. Like, like... For like, if you can, if you can put 
number one and number two's resumes up against each other. And if you look over the last, we'll say five or six weeks, Michigan's had a much better run than Alabama has. They sure have. And there's, there's no, there's no arguing it. Like, like, tell me, tell me how, you know, like, yeah, Alabama beat the number one overall team, but I feel like this season there's been a ton of sec bias. Like who has Georgia played? Right. Who has Georgia actually played? Look at, look at their schedule. They've played nobody. They put absolutely nobody. So did they, did they really deserve to be number one? I don't necessarily think so. And if you put 42 points up in your conference championship game and you only give up three, whereas yeah. Alabama's putting up 41 and giving up 24, like Michigan had the better performance. Yeah. Like, like you should be rewarded for going out there and just doing your job. Now the committee will never cop to this and the committee won't say it, but the reason that you don't get Alabama versus Georgia as two and three is because they don't want to see a rematch. They don't want that rematch. Uh, look, everybody is, is talking about how they'd love to see this game in the national championship. Well, why not get it in the semifinal, get it in the semifinal, see, see who the top dog really is. Get it one more time, run it back. Let's go. It, like to me, it, it, it's bothersome. But again, this is what happens when you have when you have people involved with this. When you have when you have the human factor involved with this. This is what it is, and it sucks. Like it's not great. But what are you going to do? It, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Well, I wasn't happy that uh, Michigan ended up where they, they they basically ended up at two. Wasn't happy about that, but. It's all right. I honestly believe that they have a they have a really good shot against Georgia. Like I don't think Georgia, like I said, has played anybody, and that offense stagnates so much. You can frustrate that offense. That offense isn't anything great. Now defensively, yeah, they might be good, but I think you kind of seen how to beat them. You know, you Bryce Young is is going to be – he's probably going to win your Heisman. We'll talk about the Heisman trophy here in, in a little bit. But Bryce Young is going to probably be your Heisman winner this year, and that dude looks incredible. Like he's the guy that the Lions should get uh, possibly next year if he comes out. It would be fantastic if they did. But Alabama basically gave you the blueprint on how to beat Georgia. So just take it, duplicate it, and do it. Like you've got you've – got elusive playmakers on this team. You've got a three headed monster at running back. You've got a quarterback who's grown with some confidence. JJ McCarthy. I think he's going to have to play a little bit of a bigger role when you take on Georgia, because he's got a bit of a cannon for an arm and he is pretty elusive in the running back or in the quarterback position. So look, I think if you're a Michigan fan, yeah, this sucks. And yeah, you got jail sexed and you got robbed, but it's okay. Like it's okay. Because I think you have a legitimate shot at beating Georgia. I don't like their offense. I think their offense is whack. I think their defense, I don't think they played anybody. Like, they don't, they, 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 they played Alabama. And that was, like, the only person they played all season. So, I, if, if I'm Michigan, you've had, the, you've had, I think, a much harder road to get here. Going from unranked to being the number two country in, the, in, 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 uh, in college football, that's a big deal. It's a real big deal. And if you look at what they've done the last couple of weeks, beating Penn State, beating Ohio State, beating Iowa in the Big Ten championship game, it's all those are all big deals. It's all big deals. So I look, it sucks, but I think Michigan has I think Michigan has what it takes to beat Georgia. Before we talk about Kenneth Walker getting robbed and Aiden Hutchinson uh, getting his nod of approval. Give me the pulse of Michigan fan. Are you happy to be in the college football playoff? Are you throttling forward saying, let's just win it all? Are you saying, man, Georgia's going to be really tough? Or are you saying to yourself, man, if they're going to lose, if they don't win it, probably better to lose to Georgia than to get their, your hopes up to play Alabama. Because I would love to see the matchup of minds between a solid defensive performance, uh, a solid defensive team of, of Michigan going up against the mind of Nick Saban. I think that's the ultimate test. You want to see where you're at. I think Michigan deserves that where you would say, man, we get the ultimate test. Um, and then plus, for me, obviously, I would love for Michigan to get there and then get the, destroyed on the biggest of big stages. That's the ultimate heartbreak. But I think that the Georgia game is going to be really tough to match up with that speed and especially – 
given the fact that Georgia has the extra time. I think Michigan has that time, too, with all those 15 practices. I think Michigan has a real good chance to play in this game and, and to compete. So I can't wait to see it. But where do you think the pulse is at? Are you cautiously optimistic? Are you saying, you know what, why not us? So I'm a little bit different as a, as a Michigan fan. As I think we've established – uh, doing this podcast now for how many years? What, seven years now we've been doing this? Eight going on nine. Uh, eight going on nine, okay. Damn. So when, yeah, I know it's a long time, right? So so when they won and you sent me you sent me a message and you said congratulations and I appreciated that. But in my head, I'm like, all right, cool, what's next? Like, who do, who do we got next? Let's go. So for me, it, it's win it all. It's win it all. It, it's, it's pound Georgia, embarrass Georgia, uh, embarrass the committee for for doing this, and then go and play Alabama. And, <laughs> like, we, we 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 play we play a bit all the time with Ric Flair, right? Ooh. To be the man, you got to beat the man. No. So in college football, Nick Saban is the man. Alabama is the man. It is the team. So to be the team, you got to beat the team. Go beat SEC. Go beat the shit out of the SEC bias. Yeah. Uh, make Paul make Paul Feinbein suck uh, a, a big. Michigan dong and, and let's roll. Let's <laughs> All go. Right. All right. Um, man, I just, if Michigan's able to get by Georgia, I would love to see Cincinnati upset. Then I think Michigan fans will get excited and then we can have a, a real quality, quality match up there of two teams that weren't expected to be there, but it's going to be fun. New Year's Eve, baby. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see Michigan handle their business and to be part of something that is so unique and so special. Both Michigan and Michigan State have appeared in the college football playoff, and let's see how far Michigan can take it. Can they take that next step? Now, what ended up happening earlier this week was a little bit interesting and newsworthy in that Kenneth Walker does not eventually end up in New York. He went from a front runner to off the stage completely. Is it warranted when you look at it? It appears that it's not a season-long evaluation. It's a what-did-you-do-in-the-biggest-moment-in-the-last-month situation. And unfortunately for Kenneth Walker, and I had said it on appearances I've made, Kenneth Walker earned his seat in New York until the Ohio State game and beyond. After that, he didn't rise to the biggest occasion that you could. And unfortunately, Aiden Hutchinson got all the love, and he appeared in two of the biggest games that were watched. And the committee just felt that Aiden Hutchinson stepping up over the course of the last three weeks way out-trumped what Kenneth Walker did throughout the season. Now, Kenneth Walker has a fair and just argument in that against Michigan, against Hutchinson, he dominated five touchdowns. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to stop this right now. Why, why does it have to be a, a MSU-Michigan thing? Like, well, because Hutchinson five, made it. Five people can go. Five people have gone in the past, I'm pretty I know, sure. I know, but it, it, the idea is that Hutchinson made it and Walker didn't. So there was, just, there was a feeling that Kenneth Walker wasn't uh, the top. I think Kenneth Walker should have been over Kenny Pickett, and it should have been number three. And Hutchinson I number agree with you. and number four. So but, I agree with you. But I also understand that Michigan State is new to the national scene. They did lose epically in a bad way on the biggest stage, and, and Walker got hurt. He got hurt at the wrong time, and it opened the door for him to be excluded. Now, I think he should come back and, and help win a natty with uh, Michigan State, hopefully. But he won't. But Michigan State's recruiting line is ooh, they picked up a nice one. And so I think that running backs are going to look to potentially take advantage of uh, the opportunities there at Michigan State. But it's just unfortunate because I felt Kenneth Walker deserved to be recognized, not for the school he went to, not for my support of Michigan State, but because of the fact he was dominant for the better part of 10 weeks and he just had a rough three weeks. But hey, that's the case. You know, Michigan gets the love. Michigan gets the hype machine. You know that potentially that Aiden Hutchinson will draw viewers to that ceremony, but he's got no chance to win. It's going to be Bryce Young's party all day long, but he gets to sit up there in a nice suit and that's fine and dandy. It's uh, it's cute. It's, it's nice that uh, Aiden Hutchinson gets uh, um, rewarded, but all I can say is go look up Aiden Hutchinson's stats against Michigan State. They didn't look Heisman Trophy-esque, in my opinion, when the number two team in the country that ended up uh, being ranked there uh, went to Michigan State. 
the running game of Michigan State did not look too afraid of Aiden Hutchinson. And I'll say that, and, and, and we can hang our head on that, but Kenneth, Kenneth Walker's got a big future ahead. Heisman Trophy now is a joke. People recognize it now when it's quarterback central. When you put Kenny Pickett up there, please, how can you respect that notion and in, in not having Kenneth Walker? I think Aiden Hutchinson should be there too. He earned it. When you show up that big, it's a big vote. When you ball out against Ohio State and, and, and the Big Ten title game, you, you I didn't say exclude Aiden. I just think Kenneth deserved to be there as well. No, you just shaded him your entire argument. And here, I'm going to poke holes in your argument real quick, too, because I'm looking at the stats right now for Aiden Hutchinson in the Michigan State game. He had three total tackles. That's it? He had one sack. He had one pass block. And if you remember, there was a touchdown that was overturned that never happened. Really, re- yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, I think he, he had a pretty good right. game against Michigan State. He had hey. a pretty good game against Michigan State. I think his, his, obviously, if you look at the stats, his worst game. His worst game was against uh, Northern Illinois. He had two solo tackles and he had uh, one sack, and that was it. That was his worst game. <laughs> so, like, uh, don't, don't don't try to shade him. Honestly, both Kenneth Walker and Aiden Hutchinson should be there. And if you remember, you go back to 1997. Charles Woodson got invited, and yeah. look, Chuck is my dude. I love Charles Woodson. Chuck is the man. All right. You look back at that season. There was a quarterback from Tennessee who went on to be one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time named Peyton Manning, who was in the running for the Heisman and it ended up going to Chuck because he was a more dominant player. Now, granted, Charles Woodson did play offense and did play defense. Drew did on special teams. Aiden Hutchinson getting it done purely on defense. I don't think he wins, but that being said, I think he has a shot. And if you look, in the biggest games, in the biggest moments, he showed up, okay? You look at the Penn State game, he had seven total tackles. He had three sacks. He had one forced fumble. Uh, one, I think he had um, – and then you go to the Ohio State game, again, seven total tackles. Uh, he had three sacks. The, the guy's just been dominant. You go to, the, go to the, the Big Ten championship game, four total tackles, one sack. So he gets it done. I don't think it's enough to win win a Heisman. I do think Kenneth Walker should have been there. I think it's unjust that he's there. Kenny Pickett, I don't necessarily think he should be there. I mean, ACC football has been absolute trash all year long. So what are we doing here? But that being said, you can go and you can look at Kenneth Walker's stats if you want to. And uh, I think Kenneth Walker had had four subpar games. Obviously, and being his worst game, uh, but... If you look at rushing totals and some of the production, his totals against Illinois, not great. 84 yards, no touchdowns. You look at his uh, game against Nebraska, 61 yards, no touchdowns. So, you know, I mean, if you're going to sling mud, you should maybe look a little bit first. Oh, no. Kenneth Walker deserved it. Look, in the biggest moment, he stepped up and got the victory over the number two Arguably the number one team in the country. I think that trumps beating Ohio State, I, in my opinion. I agree. But uh, I agree. Hey, Should hey, be there. Should but, be there. But you know what? It's all subjective. When you put it to the hands of the voters, we get to uh, we get to see what happens. But uh, hey, it doesn't discount what he did. And uh, sometimes when you get robbed like that, it might propel him to greater heights. Maybe even propels him to come back. So it might end up being the biggest silver lining of all time for Michigan State. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how this progresses, and uh, we'll see how now over the next couple weeks how Michigan prepares, gets ready for their biggest football game in a long time. Uh, Michigan-Georgia in the college football playoff. It has a nice ring to it, and I can't wait to see it. December 31st, it's going to be nice. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSTROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Make sure that anywhere that you find and listen and enjoy podcasts, you type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and our content, our weekly content, finds you just that quickly, just that easily. And if you like what you hear, leave a review. We appreciate it. Because podcasting time is over. This broadcast now comes to a close. I can't wait to talk next week when we reconvene for another episode of Doc and Jock.